Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the AME Food Testing Show. Today's topic, Canada's approach to solving foodborne illnesses and outbreaks with Rick Holly, PhD, Professor, Food Myoc, Microbiology and Food Safety, Department of Food Science, University of Manitoba, Canada. He is an active research program a researcher on microbiological ecology of meats, use of natural antimicrobials in food, zoonotic pathogens in animals and the environment. He's a former head of the Department of Food Science and has been involved in national and international committee work. He was a member of the Academic Advisory Panel, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, for two years to 2011. He's published 175 scientific papers and received awards for research. He was invited to testify before the House of Commons Agriculture Food Safety Committee and the federal government investigation into listerosis in 2009. He was appointed as a distinguished university professor in 2010. There have been over 300 news media interviews given over the last 24 months related to food safety issues in Canada. I now welcome Dr. Rick Haley. Rick, are you available? I am. Thank you for having me. I'll have you on the show. Yes, sir. Well, would you like to update us on any further activities that you've had recently? No, no. This... uh um, the other things that I'm involved in uh, probably aren't of interest to your uh, readership, <laughs> listenership. I'm an active gardener, and uh, up here in Canada, when things close down in the winter, I don't have anything to do, so I get really involved in this foodborne illness stuff. Outstanding. Dr. Hawley, could you review with our listenership the incident in 2008 with Listeria in an outbreak that killed over 22 Canadians. Mm-hmm. Andy, that uh, was a national outbreak of uh, listeriosis that was caused by contaminated cooked processed meat products that were produced at a federally inspected plant in the Toronto, Ontario area. And uh, it took place over the, the late summer um, started in June, I think, finished up in October. Um, and uh, most of the people that were ill and suffered uh, mortalities in this outbreak were age 60 plus, which is not that different from the listeriosis uh, uh, outbreak demographics related to the cantaloupes that uh, you've recently experienced there in Colorado. The um, the outbreak um, here in Canada and that outbreak that uh, you people have undergone uh, um, in uh, in Colorado attracted national attention because of the high percentage of mortality associated with listeria, and um, the mortality rates were uh, approximately uh, similar. The insidious issue associated with this organism is that it does attack people who have deficient immune systems, and so older folks then become a prime target, um, as well as those folks who have uh, other underlying serious medical conditions that affect the uh, operation of uh, of the immune system. I think there was one individual among the group, there were 23 mortalities actually, there was one individual that was age 42, but that was uh, Um, an exception to the um, general demographic of folks that were involved in this this outbreak. I think there were 57 people. So this stirred up a great deal of concern. There were lawsuits launched and settlements made. Um, And it turns out that uh, the source of the organism was uh, a semi-automated slicing machine uh, that was uh, very difficult to clean. The organism um, was isolated from uh, one of the machines, um, and uh, and of course the plant was shut down 
and was down for a couple of weeks while I did a deep cleaning of uh, just about everything in sight. And uh, they reopened, and within another few days they were shut down again because they didn't get the organism completely removed from the environment. Subsequently, um, the um, uh, the plant has... uh, and the other plants in the family of, uh, of this company, Maple Leaf, uh, have, have operated with, uh, without incident as far as I'm able uh, to understand. But Listeriosis is, uh, Listeria rather, is an organism that most of us consume on a very regular basis. And somewhere near 10% of the population are carriers of the organism, carriers that are asymptomatic. You know, there was a a very large outbreak in the mid and uh, late 90s. There were two outbreaks in Italy, 1992 and 1997, I think. In one of those outbreaks, there were over 1,500 people um, that ate food at um, uh, a school complex, um, intermediate school and a high school, um, and nobody died. And they all came down with listeriosis. Um, they were sick for three or four days, but you see the immune systems in, in these young folks it was the high school med- intermediate school uh, was were adequate to address the uh, invasive phase of uh, listeriosis. Listeriosis can cause uh, non invasive gastroenteritis when you you have diarrhea uh, like symptoms for a period of two or three days and and most folks. Um, resume their normal activities, but in older folks where the immune system is not able to prevent the invasion of uh, um, the um, central nervous system um, and other organs, but generally the central nervous system, um, one one succumbs. And it takes um, up to a month and a half for those very serious symptoms to develop. And that makes it very difficult to trace that back to its origin because the food is long gone. Well, Dr. Hawley, that experience in Canada with so many of our citizens expiring actually prevented or initiated Canada from prevention techniques and suggestions. There was a study that was engaged. Can you review it for us, those safety, food safety recommendations for Canada? Yes, there was um, a, a government-appointed uh, investigator um, charged with uh, uh, attempting to understand what needed to be done in, in order to address these uh, uh, threats from this from this organism very very specifically i mean the there there was uh, intent on on some of the uh um, government support to develop recommendations that had a broader base of impact in terms of overall food safety but the the specific charge uh made to Ms. Weatherill was was to uh put together re- recommendations that uh would prevent um this from happening again and over the course of uh, roughly eight, eight to ten months, she generated a report that contained 57 recommendations, and uh, and these had a direct focus on uh, on listeria, uh, which was was good at the time. But I had kind of hoped that uh, a broader application of the uh, investigation could have been made, but. Uh, it certainly uh, was evident that there needed to be um, better uh, communication among the various actors uh, in this country that have responsibility for uh, food safety. Food safety is a multi-jurisdictional responsibility in Canada and the United States, so you've got folks at the federal, provincial levels in departments of agriculture and health and environment that have uh, have involvement, and so uh, this outbreak in Ontario uh, developed at uh, a federally registered plant, uh, which would mean then that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency would have prime responsibility. But before they got there, um, the Ontario Department of Health had had already received reports of cases, and so they were heavily involved in um, in their system, analyzing samples and data, etc. Um, but as soon as it became evident that a federal government um, 
uh, department had responsibility, all that info had to be switched over, and it wasn't. Um, and there were time delays in terms of samples that, that were submitted for analysis and those results coming back. There was um, an incredible level of stress on the capacity of the laboratories to be able to handle the number of samples that were being generated during the course of that outbreak. Um, and uh, the recommendations that came from um, the Weatherill report attempted to try and uh, put in place structure that, that would um, alleviate the um, uh, lack of communication among those departments at various government levels uh, that have responsibility for food safety, i.e. improve the levels of uh, communication uh, under duress. There are agreements in place. There's about seven inter interdepartmental, intergovernmental um, uh, memoranda of understanding uh, in place in Canada that, that should have had an impact on reducing uh, the lack of uh, interagency um, of freedom of movement of information. didn't seem to work. Uh, we have, at the federal level, what's called the Foodborne Illness Outbreak Response Protocol. Health Canada, the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, the Public Health Agency, which is a subset of Health Canada, all have responsibility for food safety in this country, along with the provincial and municipal governments. They're all signatories to this um, Foodborne Illness Outbreak Response Protocol. But guess what? A couple of those agencies uh, didn't even look at it. So uh, this became evident in the report uh, by Weatherill, and uh, there was an immediate request that the uh, memorandum of understanding, memorandum of understanding, be updated, uh, and that there be a requirement for the various agencies and departments that had responsibility for food safety actually use the thing. And uh, I'm not so certain that what has happened as a result of the recommendations and the response from government, which was required um, within two years of the report, and, and it is now available. Um, in reading through that report, I don't see a solution forthcoming to this periodic uh, lack of uh, communication among the senior agencies that have food safety responsibility in Canada. Now, Andy, there's another thing here, too. Um, foodborne illness surveillance um, is is a vehicle for governments to be able to identify what the agents and the foods most frequently are that cause foodborne illnesses. And in Canada, we have a very um, poor system to collect this information. Fifteen years ago, we didn't. We had a reasonable system that was better than the system that was operating in, in your country. Uh, but since then, um, you've established a food net program, which is a, a cooperative arrangement among the CDC, FDA, USDA, uh, state um, governments, um, of the uh, state government health departments. And, and what it does is sets up uh, a sentinel survey system that monitors the health of about 15% of the American population. That's 45 million people. That's more people than we have in Canada. And there are 10 sites around the periphery of the United States where active surveillance of foodborne illness is reported back to a central group. And, and these data then are accumulated on a yearly basis, and it shows trends in changes of illnesses caused by different foods and by different organisms. And, and when you see these trends then, changes in frequencies and changes in organisms and changes in foods that are causing the most problems, you can relate that back to the intervention strategies that have been put in place. And in Canada, we just don't do that. We don't have a national foodborne illness surveillance program. And this report that came from the um, Weatherill Commission investigation um, did not consider uh, foodborne illness surveillance to be a very important issue. And, and I think they really missed the mark on that. Um, in Canada, um, we, we tend often to copy things that, that we see in other places. We use data, for example, on foodborne illness that are generated by FoodNet um, in 
in the United States and, and also by the counterpart Oz Food Net in Australia. And, and we use those data to characterize foodborne illness in Canada. Well, in my view, uh, since people in different geograph geographical areas eat different foods, they're exposed to different organisms. And to base uh, food safety policy on, on that kind of information, which is likely to be highly inaccurate, is simply absurd. Dr. Holly? Yes. I'm there. I, no, good. <laughs> I'm just taking a, I'm taking a breather. I'm getting a little too worked up here. Um, well, I, there, excellent work so far, and I believe that your emphasis on the Food Net program and its interrelationship with precautionary measures leads into our next subject, which is what can food producers do on the in the arena of food safety to assure that their products are safe for consumers? Well, theirs is probably the biggest job because um, they are uh, really, I see, the, the key to um, the final uh, generation of safe food products. Um, we know that uh, among a population of, uh, of companies involved in the food business, you've, you've got some, everybody is interested in staying in business, no question about that. And certainly the ones that do things right are going to stay in business probably more uh, for a longer period of time than, than those that are less than conscientious. Um, and, and so it is incumbent on food processors to put in place um, those regulations that are required of them by government and to ensure that each and every day of an operation all elements associated with those requirements are met or exceeded, and that food safety should be as important a priority as the bottom line. This is um, an issue that that goes beyond um, hiring a contractor to come in and generate a food safety program, a HACCP-based food safety program, or a HACCP um, program for them. Very often what we see is is that a uh, company will adopt such a program that's, that they've purchased um, and, and put it in a, a pretty colored binder and put it on a shelf where it promptly kind of collects dust. Um, this is meaningless and, and certainly uh, uh, corporate culture of food safety is extremely important in, in the overall production of food that has minimized food safety risk. So it's the adoption and continuous practice um, of um, food safety principles, HACCP-based food safety principles, that's just so important. I mean, food safety has to be built into food. It can't be inspected, and it can't be tested into food. It has to exist because the producer wants it to. And when that falls apart, then you, you end up with um, dirty equipment that serves as a harborage for list organisms like listeria, uh, such as occurred in Colorado at Jensen Farms and at Maple Leaf uh, in Ontario. And, and we will see in the future more of these kinds of outbreaks happening in, in commodity production where they've not been uh, seen before. Uh, because of our complacency and and the diversity of the organisms that that we that we see uh, coming forward and and now becoming uh, major players in the arena of food safety, so um, it, it requires any constant vigilance, constant vigilance. Well, Dr. Holly, you've brought up a couple of excellent points. I think the most important was food safety has to be incorporated in the food production culture at the organization level, as well as briefly retracting back to the government testing and internal testing by the food producer themselves. Can you discuss briefly the importance of testing as a combination of general practices and screening of the product prior to release to market. You, you bet. The frequency 
uh, with pa- with which pathogens occur in uh, food products, according to survey work that uh, uh, we have available to us uh, in in developed countries, um, seems to indicate that uh, they're there in processed food products anyway at levels that are less than uh, 0.1%. Uh, you might see higher levels in in produce under certain sets of circumstances and surveys in different countries show wide variation in frequencies of a number of the organisms that are topics of food safety concern including E. coli and related pathogenic types uh, Listeria uh, salmonella um, and uh, if if we're talking about the importance and value of uh, uh, of testing, um, there there are a couple of, of perspectives. In a company where um, HACCP operation or HACCP based operation uh, is uh, set up and operated uh, appropriately, um, testing is important to validate that those principles um, are being properly applied and exercised. And so when you see uh, a test result that um, is above or below acceptable limits, um, then you immediately know that you need to take some corrective action in, in, in the operation of that food safety system, whatever that might happen to be. Um, and so that gives you a heads up. Now, in certain types of testing um, where you require longer than a day or a day and a half to get results back. That's that's certainly a disadvantage. So the more modern molecular microbiological techniques uh, that are available that can be used um, do give you an advantage in terms of uh, an immediate an immediacy or a greater immediacy in terms of undertaking a, a corrective action. But where testing, I think, is is less than useful. Um, is is in terms of what it means uh, related to a positive or a negative result for a pathogen in terms of food safety. What I'm saying is is that you can't use test results for uh, an organism like E. coli O157 or other STEC E. coli um, Salmonella or Campylobacter in in a food product. To tell you that the whole lot that you've uh, the whole lot from which you have taken the sample is safe if you get a negative result, it doesn't tell you that at all. All it tells you is that the sample that you analyze is either positive or negative. This goes back to the uh, uh, the, the relationship between um, um, the frequencies with, with with which these pathogens occur and the statistical validity of the result. If these pathogens occur at less than 1%, you're going to have to test over a 1,000 samples from a lot in order to have a 95% probability that the result that you got is a correct result. So when you take one or two samples from a lot and test it and and come up negative, uh, that tells you nothing about the safety of the rest of the food in the lot. It's impossible to draw that conclusion, and this is what we're finding. Regulatory are requiring, um, in both in Canada and the United States and meat plants, series of, of six samples every few months, depending upon the capacity and production levels of the plant. And, and then these, then, are being used to in, interpret that uh, the food that has been tested is either safe to eat or not. And, and it couldn't be more illegitimate. It just bears no relationship to science whatsoever. And the public and, and um, the news media are only too ready to accept that testing such small numbers of samples is a valid um, assessment of the safety of a food product. And what this does is uh, it invalidates in the minds of the food processors the usefulness of hazard analysis critical control point programs. You see, hazard analysis critical control point programs are designed to prevent pro- 
problems from happening so that you don't have to rely upon end product testing in order to conclude whether or not the food product on the shipping dock is safe to eat. You prevent the problem from happening in the first place by having in place appropriate processes that address the important critical control points if you have those in place, if you have those as part of the process that you're using. Where it becomes problematic is in produce uh, production where you don't have critical control points. And so what you need there is the operation and exercise of good manufacturing practices to deliver um, product to the best of today's known technology that are likely to be of low risk to human health. And there's no guarantee here. Um, and, and this is in part um, the reason that we are seeing increased frequencies of uh, foodborne illness events being caused by contaminated produce because we don't have uh, appropriate control over the possibility that these organisms can get into the food product, the foods that are produced. Where, where I have a problem and in, in terms of my current understanding of, of the issues um, is um, in getting my head around the um, uh, intense nature of, of agriculture, um, the um, uh, close proximity of animal agriculture to um, produce production. We need to separate these two activities better than we currently do. Um, with the advent of mad cow disease and prohibition of the use of ruminant protein as a feed ingredient in, um, in animal production, what we've seen is um, replacement of animal protein with protein from things like uh, soybeans and other oil seeds, uh, canola, cottonseed. And these oils and those seeds are frequently contaminated with organisms like salmonella in particular. So what we're doing here um, uh, in, in substituting these, these oils and, and, and fish meal as well um, is recycling um, the pathogens through, through the animals that, that we use as food, and, and they really act as little factories um, where the organisms of concern to us in food safety multiply. They're discharged in, in manure that is used as fertilizer, and so there's the connection, one very large connection that, uh, that we see uh, that needs to be solved. We've got to break that connection between animal agriculture and uh, um, produce production in, in order to have any modicum of control over the frequencies with which we see um, produce um, causing foodborne illnesses. Back in 1970, less than 1% of foodborne illness outbreaks were caused by contaminated produce. Now we're up to 12 to maybe 15% of, of outbreaks and an even larger number of cases uh, caused by by produce, and it's not going to stop until we figure out a way of segregating the two types of agriculture. And my gut feel is this. I just don't think that we should be feeding animals um, feed that, that's contaminated with salmonella and E. coli. I think that's just plain dumb. But the difficulty, Andy, is that it's extremely um, expensive um, to segregate the feed supply to s disinfect the feed. I mean, there are ways in which this can be done. Um, uh, formaldehyde can be used, uh, and, and it's very effective, and it's required in some European countries uh, in the treatment of uh, animal feed that uh, is destined for use in poultry uh, growth. But, uh, you know, most... Uh, most soybeans that are traded internationally are contaminated with salmonella. Here in Canada, we had we had uh, canola meal um, that was to be shipped to the United States. Uh, I think there were four plants in Canada that were embargoed by by FDA because of salmonella contamination of canola meal that was destined for animals. I don't want to tell you where that went, but it didn't go to the states. It didn't get destroyed. It was used in animal production. If there were a way, 
in 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 which an appropriate um, uh, set of interventions uh, were able to be put in place to uh, reduce the frequencies with which we see feed, food animals being contaminated um, by animal feed that contains the organisms that cause us these food safety problems. I'd, I'd vote for it in a minute. Certainly one of the remedies is, uh, uh, is, is irradiation, but that's not popular among most folks. Um, but that, that would appear to be... Um, uh, a prime solution to the problem when you package under high atmospheres of oxygen, you can irradiate at dose levels that don't destroy produce and uh, uh, render the product free from organisms like listeria. But I'll stop there and let you ask me another question. Well, Dr. Holly, you have certainly caused some interesting thought into the chain of the organism transfer from animals to humans. Can we address for a minute the enhanced surveillance and early detection of foodborne pathogens, primarily in the food production arena? I, I think that uh, constant vigilance um, is extremely important in, in, in being able to, to predict the success with which you are able to generate foods that are safe for consumption. Uh, conventional testing um, can take, depending upon the organism, um, uh, can take up to four days. And uh, uh, for perishable food products that, that might have as a maximum a 14-day shelf life, that's a considerable intrusion uh, upon the, the marketability of the food product. Um, and uh, all of that, of course, is is, is tempered by the um, uh, the statistical validity of the testing. The sampling systems that uh, are used must be robust enough uh, to be able to allow a, a conclusion to be drawn with respect to the risk associated with the food that's going out the door. That can't be done alone by testing. That It's absolutely mandatory that that every opportunity uh, for exercising control over cross-contamination or um, the ability of some of these organisms to, uh, to grow in, in perishable food products to be reduced must be paired with appropriate levels of testing in order to have assurance associated with safety of food products. I hope Excellent. that answers your question, Andy. Yes, right on point. Can we address for a few minutes the idea of good agricultural practices and how that minimizes the risk of foodborne pathogens being introduced to the market? Good agricultural practices, I think, has to be the, the, the current Bible, uh, followed by uh, folks that are involved in the, uh, in the produce production arena. Uh, because we don't have um, absolute uh, critical points at which we can assure that these pathogens are eliminated. Yes, um, uh, things like um, uh, chlorine dioxide washes, uh, ozone, um, um, acidified sodium chloride, um, under laboratory conditions, are very effective in reducing substantial numbers of bacteria from a whole variety of different uh, types of produce, but they're not uniformly effective uh, against these organisms on that whole profile of, of produce that's available for sale. Um, so with that uncertainty then, uh, it becomes incumbent upon the producer to, in, to ensure safe water, uh, to, in, to ensure as best he can that uh, any of the organic uh, fertilizer that is, is being used um, um, are appropriately composted. Uh, all of the other agricultural inputs um, should, should be uh, verified uh, that they are uh, standard. Um, you know, it... <laughs> It's so frustrating. I, I would expect it to be so frustrating to be a, to be a part of this business. I mean, you could do everything right 
um, that that you were told to do by by the USDA, uh, sorry by the FDA, um, and and still come up short if you bought seeds that were contaminated. And and this goes back to that business of feed contamination for animal rearing. I mean, even the even the seeds that are used in agriculture are sometimes contaminated by these organisms, and you can't get them off. The treatments that are effective in eliminating the organisms from the seeds effectively reduce germination rates that don't make it worthwhile growing the, growing the plants from those seeds. Um, and, and so there's, there are interventions that we haven't taken yet because they're costly or because we don't quite know how to do them uniformly uh, that, that may be the future solutions to some of the problems we're currently suffering from. So back to good agricultural practices, we're totally reliant in, in the produce industry um, that that these practices be be followed to the letter. Um, issues associated with uh, rates of cooling of harvested produce were important uh, in the cantaloupe oak break in Wyoming, um, and, and certainly uh, inappropriately. Uh, cleaned machines and machines that were improperly designed for cleaning were used that shouldn't have been. Um, and, and all of these elements are important in good agricultural practices. Well, Dr. Hawley, you have certainly given us a great deal of information of which to consider in our production of food. And I think one issue that you brought out, particularly with the 2008 outbreak of listeria in Canada, is the inspection of the equipment with environmental testing. If that had been performed, as well as in the Jensen Farm outbreak of listeria in 2011, what was your what would be your supposition about that as a surveillance protocol well, for food producers? I think it's very important. Uh, when you take a look at uh, um, the the nature of um, or let's see characteristics of the, of this organism, Listeria monocytogenes. Um, we know that it that it uh, is is capable of colonizing food processing plants, and there's been um, any number of foodborne illness outbreaks in 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 Europe, four that I can think of, since the mid 1980s, where Listeria monocytogenes was resident in cheese plants for periods of time up to 12 years on food contact surfaces. So some of these outbreaks. Um, lasted three years where contaminated cheeses were being distribu- distributed around the world, and some of it went to California, uh, made people sick um, and, and caused mortality uh, because this organism was resident on food contact surfaces. And these two recent outbreaks uh, in Ontario and Colorado, uh, same deal. The organisms were able to grow uh, on uh, some food residue in the equipment in both machines were extremely difficult. Uh, both machines that were the subject of cross-contamination were extremely difficult, if not impossible, to clean and, and, and remove the biofilms of Listeria monocytogenes that had developed. Uh, we have to be able to monitor the frequency with which those pieces of equipment become contaminated. They're not contaminated all the time, usually. And and what we see, or what we've seen in meat processing plants anyway, from work that's been done in the U.S., um, is that over the summer, you'll see a gradual increase in the frequency with which environmental swabs from processing equipment become positive. And when you see that starting, what you do is switch to a parallel line, put that one out of action, cover it with a tarpaulin, pull out any uh, electronics that are likely to be sensitive, and then shoot in steam to reach temperatures of approximately 72 degrees Celsius. Um, and, And then you can wash the equipment and put it back into production. But the key here... Um, 
is is to be able to monitor um, the frequency with which or the time frame over which the equipment starts to show that it is being colonized by the Listeria organism and then uh, take it out of action before serious problems occur. That's an excellent suggestion and one that I'm sure many of our listeners are paying attention to and noting in their food safety practices to monitor. And you've brought out a couple of excellent points. One of them was the seasonality of these organisms and the residency and the resistance to standardized cleaning. Dr. Hawley, your remarks have been excellent. In the last remaining minutes, could you review for our audience your research and projects that you're currently engaging? At the well, thank you for the opportunity, Andy. Yeah. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, we've, we've been working on uh, uh, projects associated with the occurrence of E. coli 015787 in dry fermented sausages. These are sausages that are that are not cooked. They're upscale products, um, and if you cook them, they just they they just lose value. They lose f- flavor. But there have been three outbreaks recently caused by um, 015787. And so what we've, what we've done is is first of all we looked at a bunch of natural antimicrobials for their ability to control the viability of uh, E. coli in fermented sausages and ham. And and we we came upon allyl isothiocyanate. Now this is this is a um, volatile compound that gives mustard its its characteristic characteristic odor and flavor. And and it's it's highly lethal, but to E. coli 015787 under se- those sets of circumstances. Um, but the flavor of mustard is very very strong in these products at levels that are effective to kill it. In doing other work, what we found was that there was a product called deodorized mustard that's available in the marketplace, and industry uses it in cooked meat products. So we tried some of this in dry fermented sausages just to, just to see what would happen as a negative control, and lo and behold, what we found was that the uh, E. coli organism produced the same enzyme as is produced in the mustard plant to convert the glucosinolate compounds that are there naturally uh, into these flavorful compounds that are highly lethal. Um, and so in essence, what we've, what we've discovered is that we can use uh, deodorized mustard as an ingredient in dry sausages and kill a million per gram of E. coli 015787 in two weeks um, essentially, the organisms commit suicide, and and that made us very happy. We've been publishing um, on this now for a little over a uh, year and a half, um, and and we feel we're making some significant progress, not only with E. coli 015787, but we've taken a look at the uh, presence of the uh, uh, enzyme responsible for conversion of the mustard into a highly lethal antimicrobial, uh, in organisms like Listeria monocytogenes, uh, Salmonella, Typhimurium, uh, and even Campylobacter jejuni. So um, we think that uh, this new generation of uh, antimicrobial uh, might be the forerunner of, of other antimicrobial precursors that remain yet to be discovered. Uh, but we've been heartened by the results that we've we've gotten so far. We've recently put some uh, deodorized mustard uh, powder into a plastic film and put it around bologna that we contaminated with Listeria monocytogenes. And guess what? We killed those organisms in 35 days at refrigerator temperature. And this would be a product that would have a shelf life of approximately 70 days at that temperature. So... Uh, Dr. Holly, I hate to interrupt you, the fascinating research, but we are coming up to the close of the program in about 30 seconds. So you have about 20 seconds to conclude your remarks for today. I would encourage uh, food processors to not be disheartened um, by the reliance of regulatory upon in-product testing. I think that uh, the recognition that there is value 
um, in putting proactive food safety programs in place, those that are HACCP based, um, is, is yet to be fully recognized. Uh, and with the alternative that more and more end product testing will be required, uh, emphasis should return to where it belongs in preventing problems. Thank you, Dr. Hawley. We are out of time. I appreciate your attendance today and look forward to a possible potential visit in the future when you conduct more research on your antimicrobial. Thank you very much for your interest, Andy. Thank you, sir. Bye now. Bye-bye.